Let me, uh, let me read here uh, 1 Peter. We're, we're going to, we will get through uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 11 today. I've been trying, um, and, you know, I, I get distracted with all these really interesting things. Uh, I was joking with Heather last night that I think I have ADOS, and she goes, what's that? And I said, it's attention deficit, deficit ooh, shiny, you know, thing. <laughs> and I get distracted by all these truths and want to, you know, chase them down and, and talk about them in detail, but... Um, but uh, these, these things here in verses 8 through 11, which is we'll, we'll cover and conclude today, and we'll, we will start in uh, verse 12 next week, um, is just really, uh, has been really, has really struck me as uh, very, very beneficial to us uh, because of the times that we live, the instruction that Peter gave to, uh, to his church, um, and how applicable they are to us. And not just things that we should do, it gives us motivations and why we should do them. Um, not just love, but it tells us why we're doing this, um, and it tells us the result of the love, and it gives the ultimate result of all the end things, which is to glorify God through Christ Jesus. So it really encompasses so much um, in these small little verses, and this is not just, this is the end of all things, it's here's what you, it means us, should be doing right now in faith that it's the end time. So um, let me let me read verses um, 8 Actually, I'll do 7 through 11, since the end of uh, verse, verse 7 kind of sets the stage. Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we look at these words, we pray that they would just uh, be, be open to us in a very special way. And, and really just supernaturally, the Holy Spirit would open our eyes to these truths that are here that we would see the preciousness um, of these instructions that are given to us, the motivations, the results. We pray that the motivations and the results would both motivate us to, to love one another, or love, have love be shown amongst uh, ourselves, that we would be hospitable to one another without grumbling, that we would serve one another with the gifts that you've given um, as good stewards. We pray all these things would mark each one of us in this room. And, and if it doesn't, or it's not the way that it should be, that the Holy Spirit would convict us and use the words today to spur us on to uh, be, be more sanctified and to uh, desire to be more like you and bring you glory in all that we do. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. So today, and um, Brent hit on it, today is a special day historically. It's um, on June 6, 1944, uh, one of the largest amphibious landings took place. Um, it was titled Operation Overlord. Some 156,000 American, British, and Canadian soldiers took part in the invasion of Normandy. It's a, a region in France to liberate France and ultimately defeat Germany. The destiny of the world seemed to hang in the balance. On the Germany side, General Rommel had been appointed in November 1943, we know, to oversee the defense of 2,400 miles of the Atlantic coastline. Uh, for eight months, barricades, pillboxes, landmines, countless miles of barbed wire were set up in preparation to repel the uh, expected invasion. But on the Allied side, on January 1944, so what is that, about six months before Operation Overlord took place, General Eisenhower was appointed commander of the Overlord operation. The planning began. Um, the war would be decided one way or the other. Everything was riding on the success or failure of the Allies. On um, the evening of June 5, 1944, Eisenhower told the troops in, in one of his last speeches before they prepared and you know, got ready to, uh, to board the boats. He said, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. And he ended by saying, the eyes of the world are upon you. You know, the eyes of the world are upon you. You know, the reason I mentioned that is I was thinking about this statement. It just stuck in my head that I think that that really kind of captures what Peter is saying here in First Peter. Uh, because when you look at this context, um, he's saying the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, pray, continue loving, show hospitality, serve one another so God's glory would be seen through Jesus Christ. In other words, the eyes of the world or the unbelieving world are on you. 
Um, we've seen that all the way back in 2.12, where it said, you keep your conduct good, so the Gentiles of this world will see your good deeds and glorify God, right? So in other words, the eyes of the world are upon you. Um, there were two sides in the conflict on D-Day. The history of the world was written with an allied victory, and here we're talking about it 77 years later, right? 70, if I did my math right, 77 years. But there are two sides in First Peter. Uh, there's the people that are watching, and there's the people that are acting, right? Um, the world has a different value system, and they persecute us to get us to comply to their value system. Um, the other side values absolute truth and values a person and a relationship, right? Um, that has been revealed to them. They obey this truth, and this places them in opposition to the world. Um, there's a conflict, right? In, the, in our weapons, if you can call it that, are unlike the world's. Because we're to be armed, as it says in 401, with a way of thinking, a way of hoping, right? A way of, um, a way of valuing something that's greater than what the world values. And, and the world does not understand it, right? They don't, they don't comprehend this. Um, just like somebody couldn't comprehend what was going on. Of course, you know, there wasn't news agencies like there are now. You weren't able to see this. You had no idea whether it was to be successful until... It was printed in the newspapers, uh, you know, the next day or when news reports started to trickle in, you really had no idea. Um, um, but we're, we combat the persecution with something different than the world uh, can understand. We, we combat it with truth, uh, with hope, with faith, with love, with endurance and courage. And those are just in the last two chapters. That's what we're told to combat it with, um, which is different. The world fights in a different way. They value different things. Uh, they persecute us for different reasons. We respond in a certain way. That's really how we arm ourselves with a way of thinking. Again, that's very strange. Even as I say it now, I, I say, is that right? And I look at the verse to make sure that it's right because it's just so antithetical to our normal, natural human way of thinking. We want to do something. We don't want to just think a certain way or respond a certain way, right? We want action. We want victories. We want something that we can wrap our minds around that everybody can see and understand and say we were on the right side. But as you see through First Peter, that doesn't come until Jesus is revealed, until the end times, right? Uh, so our conflict is a little different. Uh, but it is a conflict and it is a war. Um, so as great as the glory is to the men who fought on the beaches of Normandy, and you'll hear a lot about it today and over the next few days, um, it's going to really last just as long as people remember. But the glory that we stand for and show to the world through our obedience and suffering is eternal, and it's greater. It's a greater glory than was won on the beaches of Normandy. Uh, because it says at the very end of verse 11, to him belong glory, there's glory, and dominion, that's control, forever and ever. And that goes forever. <laughs> there's no end to it. There is no end to that glory, so that glory is greater because the object of our focus and the person who we're bringing glory to is greater, right? Um, countries won't be remembered a trillion years from now. <laughs> I mean, maybe they will. I, I don't think so, but they won't have, I mean, what will it mean to us that there were countries other than just some information, right, that we may know? Uh, because the glory that we'll experience will be unfolding through all eternity, and it's not going to mean that much. In fact, it'll mean probably nothing compared with the glory that is ours, that our mind can't conceive or understand. So I think Peter would amplify what Eisenhower said. That's why I came, I came to this and start off with this. He would give it a spiritual focus. He would say, the eyes of the world are upon you. Or maybe uh, to rephrase 1 Peter uh, 2.12 a little bit, he says, keep your conduct honorable, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. So what we're talking about is is something that brings greater glory than what we're talking about when we talk about D-Day. Um, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I'm just saying that there are levels of glory, right? Um, and uh, ours is an eternal glory. So if you're interested in that, what we're going to look at this morning is for you. Um, it's been for me as I learned it. Um, so there, we're going we're gonna to look at three one another's. There's a love one another. There's hospitality one another, and that's how it reads in the, uh, it's kind of a very funny reading in my, in my opinion, in the, in the Greek, it actually says hospitality one another, um, serve one another. And um, last week I said there's three one another's, in fact I just said there's three one another's, um, but the one another's that you find in scripture, I think I've mentioned this before, it's this, um, it's this unique word in, uh, in Greek, um, alolos, I think is how it's said, but it just means it's a reciprocal pronoun, meaning 
I do it for you, you do it for me. We might say a quid pro quo. I, I get what I give, you give what I get, and it's sort of, you know, I do this and you'll do that, and I'll do this and you do this. So that's, that's the idea in the Greek is that, that we're doing things for each other. We owe it to each other to love. We owe it to each other to hospitality one another. We owe it to each other to serve, right? That, that's a lot of the times we see one another. However, when I actually uh, rolled up my sleeve and looked at the Greek, it, well, only one of those kinds of one another shows up, and that's hospitality one another. The love and the serve, sort of the bookends, um, it really means among yourself. So in other words, continue love among yourselves is, is, how, is how it reads in the Greek. And then serve, um, serve, serve among yourselves. And so this is talking to the church. This love that he's speaking about is specifically to the brothers, to the brethren within the church, among yourselves. So the people that are reading 1 Peter, that group that's reading it, he's saying continue that love amongst yourselves. So this is this group that he's speaking to. And serve amongst yourselves is what he's saying. So those are the three one another. So let's look at the love one first. Love one another or love amongst yourselves. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Uh, earnestly. Um, notice the word keep, um, which indicates that loving amongst themselves is something that was already happening. Um, and he tells them to keep it up. So keep on doing what's good. Um, now, sometimes I understand as the, the, the principal, let's do this, is more like a, I'm giving you something to achieve. Not that you're doing it, but I'm trying to encourage you to do it. So it could be that too. But I don't see any indications that they're not doing it. So I think the keep or let's keep doing this is more of a uh, they are doing it and let's continue to do that even more. And, and he gives this above all. So in other words, this is above everything else you're doing, love one another. Um, this word, uh, and so in the face of end times, we shouldn't be scared or sharing about all these interesting things that are happening in time, or did you see this, or did you see that, or is this going on? Not that none of that is, uh, that that's bad, just that above all of this other thing, you should be marked by love. Not by somebody who knows all the times and the seasons and everything that's going to happen and how everything's going to fit into place. So instead of spending your time on that, and not don't spend time on that, but above that, you should be marked as a person who loves. There should be love amongst yourselves. Um, and we see in John that uh, people will know that we belong to him by what? By our love for one another, right? It's for our love for each other is how the world sees this. So this is a glory that the world sees. It's not a glory like they see anywhere else. So it's different than what they see. Not just loving somebody because they can do something for me. It's loving them because of who love them, right? It's, it's sort of this back and forth kind of thing. It's different. It's greater than. Um, and this word earnestly, this is the second time this word has shown up. It, it's a compound word in Greek, ektino. Ek just means out. And the taino, um, it's where we get the word tense or tension in English. It comes directly from this Greek word taino, or it just means to stretch. So somebody who stretches out before they work out, right? They're stretching to the max. Now, the max for some people is a lot greater than the max for other people, right? Uh, because they may stretch out more. They may, in the, in the analogy here, you may love more. And the more you love, the more you can love. The more you become more and more stretched. But there's this constant thing. The, uh, the person who's um, working out of the athlete doesn't just stretch this far and always stretch this far, right? They stretch this far, and now that's pretty easy. So now what do they do? They stretch even further, right? And then when that becomes, uh, becomes easy, they stretch even further. They kind of, that, that's the idea of this word, is you're stretching out to the maximum amount you possibly can. That's, that's what this word means, this tension. Until there's tension, until you can take the little bungee cord and go twang to it, right? It's not stretched to the full. You take a bungee cord and just go like this, and it's limp, and you're not going to make any sound. But it's stretched all the way as far as you can. And it makes that sound or it has that certain feel that now that's about as far as this is going to go. I'm not going to stretch any further, right? Uh, that's, that's how this word is used. Uh, it's a maximum potential of you, uh, which I think is a really beautiful word to use for love because my capacity for love now is different than my capacity for love 10 years ago. However, the command is still to love maximally. So you may say, well, I can't love like Wink does. <laughs> Look at that. Look at how he serves and gives of himself for other people, right? That's not the command. It's not to love like Wink does or anybody else does. This is you be maximally stretched out. And that's only something you can answer between you and the Holy Spirit is how far you stretch. Are you really loving as much as you possibly can? Are you asking for the strength to, to love even more? 
this is the second time it's shown up. It shows up in 122. Um, and I'll just read it. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So this, this idea, and you notice that both the times these words are used, that is loving one another. It's within the group, amongst yourselves. Love each other. Um, this word earnestly is to be fully stretched out maximally for each other within the group, uh, within the, the brethren, so to speak. So that kind of love that we have for the brethren is to be fully stretched out for each other. Um, in 4.8, we see this admonition to keep loving in this stretched out way. Um, and this time in 4.8, I'm sorry, in 122, it shows this kind of love is fully stretched out for each other. And there is a that comes from a person who is motivated by sanctification. In other words, I am sanctifying myself so I can love this person stretched out. Do you, you see this? So you're supposed to love maximally, but so you can do it even more, you become sanctified, which is obedience to the truth. We, when we looked at that, we said that's sanctification. I become sanctified so I can love greater, so I can be more maximally stretched out. So I'm not thinking as much about myself I'm thinking about Christ and his glory so I can love even more. I'm forgetting myself and what I want, laying those things to the side so I can love this other person, right? So in 122, you see the motivation for loving, uh, for motivation for action so you can love greater. And for eight, the admonition is to keep loving in the stretched out way. And this, you, you see a result. The result is it covers over a multitude of sins, uh, which we're going to see what that, I think it says here in a second. Um, in 122, it's an adverb. Here in 48, it's an adjective. So really both times it's describing the kind of love that the brethren have for each other. Um, and I, if you remember one thing, that there is a kind of love that happens within the church that's unlike the kind of love that happens in the world, right? And then when Jesus says, they're going to know you by your love, I think what he's speaking about is the kind of love that we have for each other. It's not just that I'm loving, I'm seeking to love even more, and I'm doing everything that I possibly have, and I'm trying to grow that capacity, right? And, and look at the result of the capacity is different than how the world loves. The world will love, but they're not going to cover over something, right? Um, they'll cover over their own sins, but covering over someone else's or letting that go when it's time to let it go, that's something that they have a hard time with. In fact, they see, that as, um, they see it as corrupt love, that you shouldn't love that way. I mean, one of my favorite things is love through the Spirit. It makes me think of uh, Paul said, I have not seen or heard nor can God prepared for those that love him. Mm -hmm. So that whole segue is into uh, what the Holy Spirit does for us. So here it says, Love through the Spirit, 122. All right. Well. And love is a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Um. So uh, just in the interest of time, kind of skipping over, you know, they, the phrase love covers over a multitude of sin can be very problematic if you just look at that phrase and say, oh, so if I see something wrong, I don't do anything about it, right? So I don't have to do church discipline, and I just want to come to a church that just loves me for who I am, right? And they're not going to call out how my life doesn't align with the truth, right? Um, even without going outside of 1 Peter, you can see that's not the case, because uh, the very first time he used this kind of love in 122, um, he says um, it comes that, that from the people who are being obedient to the truth. So how do you align being obedient to the truth and loving in this way? How can you do this? Um, the obedience to the truth comes first, so you can love. How can you reconcile those two things? And they don't. I mean, logically they don't. Biblically they don't either if you look at other places. So this is not... Um, I, I just wanted to answer the question, or I asked myself the question, how, what does this mean by covering over a multitude of sins? Um, and I think there's two possible reasons, and both of them I could back up from scripturally, so I'm going to give you both, and I'll let you decide which one you want to, and it may be both. It might, sometimes I think the Holy Spirit is specifically general in some ways of saying things, because it could mean multiple biblical truths can be folded underneath that truth, right? Um, and uh, this one, is, so one option is, as we love our fellow members of the flock, the love for them is greater than the sins we know them to have committed. Now, this is not saying we're ignoring sin. Um, rather, it's most likely telling us how to live with them after it's been dealt with. Because uh, sometimes forgiveness after that person has repented is difficult. It's easier just to, because now I don't have to look at the person and think about what they did or how they wronged me because they're out of the fellowship. I don't have to deal with them. <laughs> 
I'm not eating with them, I'm not fellowshiping with them, I'm not hanging out with them. They don't come to church. I don't see them, so it's great. I don't have to deal with it, right? But it's a different kind of love once that person's repented. Now you have to deal with it, right? And I think that's what he's talking about is this love covers over a multitude of sin. Now that they've repented, I'm going to bring them back in. I think this is the kind of love that Paul called for in the Corinthian church when he asked them to restore to fellowship the man who had been disciplined. Now you see that in 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8, Paul tells this church that the man who was put out of the church for his sin has suffered enough punishment. That's sufficient. It's like he's saying, the punishment that you gave him, that's sufficient, right? This ostracization. Um, think what it would be like to be somebody who identifies as a Christian, who won't deny that they're not a Christian, but yet be kicked out of your Christian fellowship in a world that persecutes you. It's hard for us to comprehend that because you say, well, if you kick me out of here, I've got five million other churches here I can go to. That's no big deal. That loss of fellowship isn't a really big deal. It should be. It really should be, but it's not. We don't fear that. But try to put yourself in a position where there's only one church and you love Christ and you've been kicked out of that fellowship. And now you're being persecuted by the world by yourself with nobody relying on, just you and God strengthening you because of the sin that was in your life, how, how difficult of a situation that would be. You'd be literally like a sheep with wolves circling around you and the flock off in the distance and you can't get there, right? It would be a scary thing. And so Paul is saying he suffered enough, now bring him back in. And his admonition um, is really found in verse 8. And is the, I'll quote this. It says, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Do you see that? He says, restore the fellowship. So I beg you. Paul is begging the church. This person who, I mean, Paul is the person who says, I am an apostle and I have the authority and I can, I can come in and tell you what you should be doing. Yet here he is begging them to reaffirm them. Uh, with the love, uh, which I think fits right in with what we're looking at. So when the Corinthian church was obedient to Paul's instruction, their love for this man resulted in the restoration of fellowship. But it also, before, resulted in them him being kicked out, right? Same love, different, different results, but different stages of the person's repentance. Um, so notice that the sin was dealt with. And after the punishment, he, he was affirmed in love. Um, the implication is there was repentance by the man. You, you see this implication here, and I think when you take 1 Corinthians and what likely this man had sinned and done, how he'd been kicked out in the 2 Corinthians, I think when you put it all together, you see that he had repented. Um, it's also akin to the gentleness we are to restore someone who is caught in transgression. If you look in Galatians 6.1, it says that we who are spiritual should restore a person caught in transgression in a spirit of gentleness. So um, there's this idea of restoration again. Paul says to reaffirm your love for him, to restore him to the fellowship. Here in Galatians 6, he tells the church in Galatians that they, uh, we who are spiritual should restore with gentleness. And I don't know, uh, in that word gentleness, um, it really is the Greek word for meekness, which means power in reserve. It's not a weak person who is meek. It's a person who's very strong, who reserves their power. That is a meek person. We think in our language, meek means somebody who's like really milk toast, very soft, very quiet spoken, right? Uh, but not in the Greek. The Greek is somebody who's very strong. Um, an analogy might be somebody who's very big, very muscular, very strong, maybe world champion in something or other, right? I think of those shot putters. I mean, they have muscles on their muscles kind of people, right? But I've seen those, those men hold their little baby girl. That's meekness. Strength, reserved and controlled, is meekness. That's a picture of meekness, and that's what he's talking about here. Restore them with your power in reserve, right? So you can draw the analogy there. The second way, uh, again, in the interest of time, I see is that sin being covered is that all could be a personal one here. Uh, putting uh, verse 22 in chapter 1 and 4, 8 together um, joins, I think, this kind of love among us. So the motivation for my obedience to the truth is love for my brothers, this kind of stretched out where love results in my sanctification, which decreases the sin in my life. So in essence, my sanctification that causes me to love my brothers decreases or covers over a multitude of sins that could have happened if I wasn't being sanctified in obedience to the truth, right? So I think there could be a personal aspect of this as well. Um, a way that I explained it is, you know, we might look at an intersection and be thankful there's a stoplight there. Because if there wasn't a stoplight there, just think of all the accidents that would happen, right? 
Um, not that the accidents did happen, but we can easily make the conclusion that, well, if there wasn't a stoplight here, just think of all the accidents are here, so I'm thankful there is, so there's not as many accidents. I think it's kind of the same logic that you could put here, that love covers over a multitude of sins as I'm sanctified. I'm thankful that I'm sanctified because if I wasn't, just think of all the sins that I would do and how hard it would be and the problems that I would cause with the love among the brethren. Um, so I'll let you decide. The second one, hospitality one another. Um, and I know it sounds a bit strange to say hospitality to one another, but that's really how it's said in the Greek. And, uh, and I just liked saying it that way. Sometimes when you read something again and again, it kind of, I don't know, it doesn't really get your attention. And when you look at a slightly different way or a different version, it's like, oh, is that really what it's saying? And that's kind of what jumped out to me is hospitality to one another. And I learned this, I remember this from when Josh was here, he, he said this and I said, is that right? And I looked it up, and he was right. Uh, that in the, in the Greek, it um, literally means love of strangers. It's uh, philos xenos. Xenos is strangers or aliens. Philos is, I mean, we know Philadelphia or brotherly love. So it's brotherly love for strangers. Um, and it just sounds strange to say, have a love for strangers for one another, right? But I think when you put it together with what we just looked at, that love covers over a multitude, you have this returning of fellowship. Um, notice that the second part is without grumbling. And that word for grumbling is secret debate in your mind is what it has in the Greek. That's what the word means. Or um, a secret disapproval that you don't share with them. So it's like, uh, I, I just, you know, there's a lot of funny memes out there. One of them is how cats look at you like they're silently judging you all the time. <laughs> But I think of that phrase, silently judging, is like, okay, well, I'm going to invite, invite you over to my house, but inside, I'm not going to forget what you did to me. I'm not going to forget how you treated me. I'm not going to forget the wrongs. I heard what you said about my friend, and I know this and that, so God commands me to be hospitable, so as I'm going to be hospitable, but I'm going to do it grumbling on the inside, right? And he's saying, no, show hospitality to one another without that internal debate. Um, and that's, that's a very difficult thing. Um, Someone who is uh, disciplined for unrepentant sin is supposed to be put out of the fellowship, but when they repent and confess, they're supposed to be restored to fellowship. Um, and it, it's going to put you in a very vulnerable position because you feel like, well, they have to feel the pain of what they did, right? And it's hard to forgive them. It becomes like the root of bitterness. Honestly, the root is pride, right? I was wronged. I don't feel like I have been served or that person has suffered enough. It's my judgment thinks that they haven't suffered enough, so therefore, I'm not going to let them go. I can't let them go, right? Um, in essence, they were one of us. Then they were strangers because of discipline. They were restored to fellowship, and now we are to show hospitality to them once again without any internal, internal secret discontent or resentment. Um, and like I mentioned, it's, it's vulnerable. It puts you in a very vulnerable spot, uh, especially from the side of pride, um, it means to set aside our desire to appear right and restore one another in a way that God restores us when we are repentant. Uh, we're called to treat one another as God has loved us. And how many times has God reminded you of all the bad things you've done? Again and again and again. I mean, does he do that? When he forgives us, does he forgive us? Do we have to continually ask forgiveness for the same sin again and again? I mean, I challenge you to find a verse that says that, right? It says if we confess faithful to forgive us he is right he, he forgives us faithfully um, and how much more should we be don't be like that servant who has forgiven the great amount and we turned right around and held the person that owed him 60 bucks and threw him in jail <laughs> right notice notice who brought the um, that, that was a travesty of justice and notice who brought the travesty of justice up the other servants his fellow servants saw what happened they knew what had happened how much more will the world look at us and think of when we say, I've been forgiven all of this and I give my testimony, yet I won't forgive my fellow brother in Christ who also are, are forgiven, just like I'm telling everybody they can be forgiven, right? How incongruous is that? And uh, it doesn't display God's glory, and so we're told not to. And that's, that's hard. Uh, I, I think it's hard. For me, it's hard. Because it means we have to set aside things that are not important, Right? And if, I, and if I went and listed what I would say is not important, that doesn't show up in Scripture, that's not about Christ's glory, I think I would step on some toes. I would step on my own toes, right? My own opinions of things, whether it's health or politics or what I should be doing or what their kids should be doing or what my kids should be doing. Or I mean, you know, we all have our opinions, and we have lots of them, right? 
Um, but is it important? Are you willing to set aside that for what's important to be obedient to loving one another and to be hospitable, hospitable one another and not grumbling in my head? In other words, not having the secret debate and judging them silently because of something that they believe or something that they do, right? That's not important. What's important is seen at the very end of verse 11, which is the glory to God through Jesus Christ, uh, which is the glory that lasts forever. So be willing to set aside what's not important for what is important. Is there anybody that you couldn't invite over to your house and enjoy fellowship with them and not have these debates going on in your head and constantly remember all the things they've done wrong? And that's, that's hard for me to say because there are people that I would have a very difficult time with. And I think that's what he's challenging us to. And I'm saying just in our church, if you expanded that out to more, man, we've got a lot of, well, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> you just say it that way. You can speak for yourself. Um, so serve one another. The last one here. This is a continuation of the first two, love and hospitality. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. And there's just wonderful truths in here, and I'd love to spend all the time on it, but I, I promise that we get through verse 11. But notice a couple things. We each have a unique gift that's given to us by the Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 11 um, he says, all these, these speaking to the gifts have been given to us are the work of one and the same spirit who apportions them to each one as he determines. So if you say, I wish I had more of this or more of that, or I wish I had this gift or that gift, or how come I get this gift? Really, all you're doing is grumbling against the person who gave it to you as he desired. The Holy Spirit gave it to you for a reason. So why are you complaining about it? Furthermore, why aren't you using it for the purpose? Serving one another, Right. Um, maybe, maybe it seems like you can get other gifts because it says earnestly desire these other gifts and pray for them. Maybe the Holy Spirit will give them to you. But why would he give you more when you're not even faithful with what you had, right? With, with a little bit of whatever gift you've been given, are you being faithful with that? And if you're being faithful with that, then maybe the Holy Spirit will answer you for these other gifts. Um, I don't think it's wrong to desire other gifts because we're told that we can pray and ask for other gifts. However, to desire the other gifts in a selfish way and being upset with what we've been given is wrong and not to serve one another using the gifts that you've been given also is a sin so don't be sinning when you're asking for something else right be obedient to what you have do what you should be doing first um, and in uh, in first corinthians 12 these gifts are called uh, manifestations of the spirit it literally means that's how the spirit manifests himself in your life that's how other people see that the Holy Spirit is working through you is by the gifts you've been given. I mean, think about that. That holds a lot of weight. Um, and we're supposed to use them, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, for the good of Christ's body, which dovetails right along with what it says here, uh, one another. Um, the gifts are a manifestation of God's grace here. You also see for the purpose of benefiting Christ's body. Each person in the body of Christ should value one another gifts, not just my gift, but the gifts that other people have been given. And I think that means that we should encourage them to use their gifts or help them find their gifts. Um, that there are ways that you can do that. Um, just because one gift of preaching may be more flashy and visible doesn't mean other gifts which are more private like serving are any less valuable. And, and you see this example of speaking and serving, right? Serving can be something you never see. Someone who comes in and sets up the tables for our class before we even get here, that's a gift of serving. Did you even know who does that? Somebody does it. And if you didn't do it, or she didn't do it, right? How would that affect our class or the ministry that we have? So there's, there's, there's private gifts too. Um, I think the example is, how can one part of your body say to another part, I don't need you, <laughs> right? Um, you know you need them when it stops working or when it hurts, right? What happens when you smash your, smash your little pinky? What does your whole body do? <laughs> like, just gotta cup this and ow, ow, and, and everything you do is, this, but how much do you think about your little pinky when you're going throughout the day? Well, not much, but when you need it, you're really thankful that you have it. And when you don't have it, it's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, you know, there are parts inside of us that we don't see. And when that's not working correctly, it messes with our health. There are parts, there's parts that are glorious, there are parts that are inglorious, right? But we need all of them, and God has designed all of them. And so uh, when, when we don't have them, we miss them. And so don't, don't disparage people that, that have gifts that may not be as flashy as yours. Um, I, I, I think you can understand that. But notice that the gifts, that we, when we use them, we're being good stewards of God's grace. And this word, this um, varied grace, 
is the word in Greek. It's just this wonderful word, multicolored. So it's multi-hued grace. So it's not just one color. Um, I think that gifts, I, I, I would go out on a very, uh, I think it's a very safe limb, but a limb and say that each one of us has a gift that's never been seen in the history of the church. I think each one of us with our talents and the mixtures of our personality and the situation that we're in, the time that we're in, the age that we're in, the, the time that we live in, the, the, the country that we live in, the city we live in, the kind of climate in our church, the kind of church that you're a part of, all those things go together with the kind of gift that the Holy Spirit says, this is the kind of gift I'm going to give Ken Carpenter because that's going to fit the flock at Valley Forth. And I think I think that's how the Holy Spirit gives them out, which is just you possibly can't. I, I, I resist a little bit these tests to say you have this gift. Um, it may be helpful to kind of steer you towards it, uh, but uh, but I don't think you can box up the gifts into just 24 or 12 or 13 or whatever it is. I think there's mixtures of all these different things. Um, the, and that, that, that's why I think Peter says multi-hued and uses a way to, that you can't really put it in a box. It's just unique. I mean, there's what, 16.7 million colors that our human eye can see. And there's even more that our human eye can't see, right? And uh, that's hard to imagine a color that I can't see, right? But it is. They're, they're there. And so, um, you know, our gift, I think, is really unique. And this word of being a steward means you're a household manager. In other words, uh, the, the word meant a normal, it was a freed man, not a slave, but somebody who had been freed, somebody who had been freed from legal servitude, yet they managed someone else's property. Kind of like a, um, a Joseph. Well, Joseph wouldn't be a perfect example. But imagine if Joseph had been freed and he chose to serve Potiphar and he was in charge of everything. And remember how many times Joseph, at least twice, where he went into the situation he was in, they just gave him, let him run everything, and they didn't worry about anything, right? Uh, actually, three times, right? Potiphar's house, in the jail, they put everything, the jailer didn't worry about anything, and then it says Pharaoh put everything under him and didn't worry about anything. I mean, imagine what kind of person had that kind of trust in those situations, right? Um, and are you that kind of person that God would trust to say, I'm going to give him a gift or her a gift, and they're going to they're gonna follow through on it, and I know I don't have to follow up with them because I know they're going to do what I ask them to do, and I trust them. And so now I'm going to give you more responsibility or more responsibility or different gifts or more gifts, and I don't even have to worry about it. Um, he gives two examples, speaking and serving. Um, speaking, uh, he actually uses this word, an, an oracle. Um, an oracle was a divine utterance, something which a human spoke, but the origin was purportedly from a god. So you have these, you've heard of the oracle of Delphi and things like that. And if you ever read about these oracles in Greek, um, they spouted nonsense, like they spoke in riddles, and they couldn't really understand, and they had people that would explain what the oracle said, but the oracle spoke directly from God, right? Um, and they were God's mouth, or, or the God or goddess's mouth there, and you would go and you would pay lots of money and speak to them, right? Um, and that's the idea of an oracle. But what he's saying here is that when you're speaking God's oracles, it's a really unique way of saying, and, and when Peter wrote, that would be the Old Testament and a little bit of the New Testament, mostly the Old Testament. So um, I think what he's talking about here is just someone who speaks God's thoughts from a passage of Scripture. Um, kind of like in Ezra, where all the people stood up, they read the law, and there were these men that went through and explained what he had just read, what he had just read. It's just, here's what it is. Now they exposited and explained it, and they read more, and they explained that, and they read more, and they explained that. So that's the ministry, I think, of speaking oracles. Serving, um, they serve by the strength that God's pro God provides. And the strength to exercise our gifts comes from the same source that gives us our gifts. So he not only gives us the gifts, he gives us the strength to exercise the gifts. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but um, I just remember many times uh, back when we had a, back before we moved to Seattle. So man, this must have been um, about 15 years ago, something like that, when we had Awana. I was over there in the gym, and uh, I remember um, Chris and I did TNT for the, for for the boys, and so we were on point for that. And, um, and and I remember um, how many times on Wednesday I was like, oh man, I am so tired. <laughs> I, it's been a long day. I really don't want to go. Uh, but I'd say, well, I've, I was obligated. I, I wish I could say I spiritually said, God, I'm going to let you give me the strength or anything. Like I'm like, oh, I have to go because they'll notice if I'm not here and I would go. But by the end of the night, I was like, wow, that's, I mean, I had more energy after than I did before I went in. And, and that happened enough. I'm like, it took me a while, but I'm like, wait a second. 
it's like I'm going with faith, and I started getting to the point where I would go with faith that God would give me the strength. And every single time, I, I mean, this may not come as a surprise to you, but every single time God gave me the strength to go through the situation. So it was, um, it was interesting. So um, looking at the time here. So wrapping up, uh, on the gifts, we are the ones who use the gifts God has given to us. Um, we're to use them to serve amongst us we do so, we're good managers of the resources God has given us. The purpose for this is so God will be glorified in Christ. We use gifts. It's a question. We use the gifts, but Jesus is the one who's glorified. No, sorry, God is the one who's glorified, but not through us. It's through Jesus Christ. Have you notice that? You're given the gift. The gift glorifies God, but God is glorified not through what we've done, but through Jesus Christ you would expect it to say through us being obedient to using the gifts. And what does that mean? You know, uh, I don't have the time to expand on this, but I would just present uh, humbly that I think what he's talking about here is that we are Jesus Christ in the world. I mean, I'm not physically Jesus. I mean, you know what I'm saying. It's like I represent to the world Jesus Christ. Jesus said this many times. He said, well, they can't get at you, so they're going to come after you. Because when I leave, they're going to come after his servants which is you, right? But you're doing this in my name. You're doing this for my glory. You're representing me. You're an apostle, which is somebody who's like an ambassador, or a herald who's going and heralding something that the king has given you or that something important has given you. So we are representatives of Christ. And how many times is the church called the body of Christ? And Christ is the head of the church. So I think this is another way of saying is you are literally participating in representing Christ's glory to the world who is watching. So coming back to what Eisenhower said, the world is watching. Peter says it, let your conduct be honorable. So when the Gentiles see it, what do they do? They give glory to God. And that's how verse 11 ends. God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Uh, to him, it could be either pointing to God or Jesus. We're not sure. I think it points to Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So in the face of these end things, we're to be self-controlled, sober-minded, so that we can pray effectively. And as we face the end of all things, our focus should be loving one another maximally, being hospitable to one another with no internal muttering, no complaining inside, right? The, the battle is on the inside, not the outside. The battle is, on, is in our thought to serve one another faithful to what God has given us. And these things will glorify God through Christ because the body of Christ sees uh, I'm sorry, the world sees what the body of Christ, that would be us, is doing and being obedient to what God has said. So I think that's how all that fits together. Any any questions on that before we close in prayer? If uh, Jesus had all the gifts, and we're become more and more like him, so it means if the more sanctified, right, or we yield himself to the Holy Spirit, the more the different gifts other than specific, specific gifts is manifested in us? Could be. I mean, he, he actually knew a lot more stuff. Um, he never dealt with computers or, you know, auto mechanics or anything like that. And I think there, I mean, you look at the gifts in the Old Testament that were, were being able to use bronze, uh, right, to paint, to, uh, to actually do artwork, uh, to play music. I mean, those are specific gifts in the Old Testament. So that's why I think when it says multi, multi-hued, um, I think there are gifts that are given to us that if Jesus was here and now, he probably would have. But at his time, there was no need to actually manifest this. Maybe he had them back then. I don't really know. I'm just saying, I think that the gifts that we have are so unique. Um, and I think they're broader than sometimes we think um, in, in, the new, in the New Testament. The other thing you mentioned, you're talking about eternity and things like that. But if, if God was outside time, which he does, then we're someday going to be with him. Then we're going to be living outside of time. So eternity, we probably won't have a concept of eternity because we live outside of time. Right? Maybe there, there is a debate on that, um, and I don't want to, uh, you know, that that's a really good question. And there is a question is, is God outside of time? Can he interact with time? And if that's the case, and how does he know what's happening? And how does he know when to speak to me? I and mean, there's all these conversations. I, I, will, I will just go as far as it says that if it's time, it's, it, it's, there's no end to it. If, it's, uh, if there's no time, there's still no end to it. So no matter, I mean, it's not, it's not counted. Um, God created us to live in this world. And when he created the world, he created it with time. 
He created the stars to mark out seasons and times and things like that. So what will the new world have? I can't say for sure. There's indications that there may not be seasons like we have now, but there are also indications that show that there may be. We don't really know. It's hard to... I can't, can't see. Is, is there a difference between not being able to see something and not being able to distinguish something? Just to... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. I... I Sorry to cut short. I have to get over because I have to do the information desk. <laughs> so I, I just realized I'm probably a little late. But anyway, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your truth. We, we pray that you would take these words to heart, that we would look for ways that we can be obedient to the truth so that we can love one another. We pray that that would truly become a motivation for us, that we aren't becoming sanctified just so we can look better in the eyes of other people, um, or, or feel better about ourselves, but our motivation would be so we can love one another, that we can uh, remove sins for our lot, from our lives so those around us in the church will be more easily able to love us so we can have love for one another. We pray that that would become a motivation. Um, and even above that, we pray that there would be a motivation to glorify you, uh, that through our lives, through our actions, through our behaviors, through our thoughts, through intents, through anything that the world sees, that they would see the love, they would see the hospitality, um, that's consistent with the love and that they would see the serving one another um, using what God has given us, these, these unique gifts. I um, pray that we would use them for one another and not just ourselves. Uh, we pray this in your son's name. Amen.